in the Gospel of Luke. Luke records Christ's words concerning his second coming. Theophilus is always in the background. That's Luke's audience. As he writes to Theophilus, he's speaking not only of the deity of Christ and the fact that Jesus was Messiah, but he's also teaching us and teaching Theophilus the fact that the crucifixion is not the end. Christ will rise. He will ascend. He will sit at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again. Amen. Now he's come as a suffering servant. But then he will come as a triumphant king. Just a few days before, Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. A king who was coming in peace. But when he comes again, he will be coming in victory, riding a white horse. And his armies will follow with him. We'll be part of that. In Luke chapter 21, if you'll turn with me there, Christ has just observed the widow who's given all that she had and had given more than all others really put together. Because they were giving out of their abundance, she gave out of her necessity. But you know, that tells us where her faith was. She committed her whole life, she committed her present and her future to the God that she was worshiping and serving. And then Christ's attention is taken away by the disciples from this wonderful scene of this woman who just put in everything that she had. And they begin to point out to Christ, look at all of this marvelous building. The years and the money and the time and the lives that had been spent in building these things. And Christ told them, I tell you the truth, that there will not be one stone that will be left upon another. And anyone today can go to Jerusalem and see that there's not a single stone left. Disassembled. 70 A.D., the Romans under Titus destroyed the temple of God. Had God failed? Absolutely not. Was he mindful of what was being done? Absolutely he was. He had warned Solomon when Solomon dedicated the first temple that if my people Israel disobey me and continue in their ways, I will remove this building from my sight. And that's exactly what God had done. 70 A.D., some 40 years after Christ was crucified. In 72, Masada fell. The Romans expelled a majority of the Jews and they were dispersed around the world. There was a remnant, remnant that remained in the land, but as an insult to the Jewish people, the name of the land was changed to the land of the Philistines. And that's where we get Palestine from. It's not the land of Palestine. And the people are not Palestinians. They're Arab. But it's still the land of promise. God's covenant has not changed. The work of the Romans changed absolutely nothing in the economy of God. And one day, Israel will occupy all of the land 
that was promised through Abraham. And it will be overseen by Christ himself. He will come and he will rule from Jerusalem. And together, Jew and Gentile, his church, his followers will serve him and his administration. In verse 10 of Luke chapter 21, it says, Then he continued to say to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things... They will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It reminds us of the Apostle Paul, doesn't it? Luke joined Paul on some of his missionary journeys and was privy to Paul's persecution and to his arrest, his imprisonment. And out of his experience with Paul and education and tutelage under Paul comes forth even the gospel of Luke. Luke researched carefully the things that concerned the Messiah. But Christ says that these imprisonments and these persecutions will be an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds, he says, not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. He advises just the opposite of what our natural man would do. We would want to prepare ourselves. But Jesus says, make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. Folks, we're seeing this even today. You go to countries, certain countries around the world. It is considered if you become a Christian, you are now an infidel. You have dishonored your family and worthy of death. In some cultures, they hold a funeral. You're totally exercised. You're, you are ostracized, as it were, from your family. You are considered dead. There's a high price to be paid. Family members turn on family members. But you know what? Luke said earlier in his gospel that Jesus causes division. And he's causing division even today. People frown at that statement, but it's biblical. Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. Is there peace through Christ? Yes, we have peace with God. But that doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have peace with one another. Because brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers will turn on their children. Why? Over Jesus. They will reject their own because of Christ. Nabil Qureshi's family became very cold and distant when he became a Christian. I talked with a lady the other day. As a matter of fact, we had dinner with them in our home. and She was a Jew who converted to Christ. She became convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And on top of that, she married a Gentile. And she said, our history is storied. A physical daughter of Abraham becoming a spiritual daughter of Abraham. Through faith in the Messiah. And now is serving him faithfully. But there's been a price that was paid. Jesus does cause division. There will be suffering. There will be rejection. There will be resistance. There will be death as a result of following the Messiah. 
But we have the luxury of reading the back of the book. We know how the movie ends. The bridegroom does get his bride. We, the bride. But then he goes on to say, and Pastor Don began reading here, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Folks, this is looking beyond 70 A.D. This is looking beyond that to a time when God will regather the Jews into the land and Israel's enemies who encircle her even today will come against her. Because this is looking toward the actual physical, visible, literal coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming of Messiah. So Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Zechariah prophesied about this ages ago, centuries before the Gospel of Luke was written. And I want to read just a handful of verses from Zechariah. Zechariah 14, and you can turn with me there. Zechariah 14. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. Listen to what he says here. This is God speaking. For I, 14, chapter 14, Zechariah 14, verse 2. For I will gather all the nations. Who's gathering them? God says, I will gather all of the nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city will be captured. The houses plundered. The women ravished. And half of the city exiled. But the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations. As when he fights on the day of battle. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah is looking ahead not at the first coming but at the second coming. And this does not contradict but complements what Jesus is saying in chapter 21 and what he also said in Matthew 24 of his visible, literal coming. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley. So that... Half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. You will flee by the valley of my mountains. For the valley of the mountains will reach to Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. You read that in Revelation 19 as well. In that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle. For it will be a unique day. Which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, the only king. And his name, the only one. He is the king of kings. 
He is the Lord of lords. When he comes, Zechariah says in verse 11, people will live in it in Jerusalem and there will no longer be a curse. For Jerusalem will dwell in security. The suffering comes before the glory. The capturing, the ravishing. The captivity comes before the glory. When the enemies of Israel is saying peace and safety, hey, we've won. And we finally accomplished what we set out to do, and that is to destroy Israel and take Jerusalem. When they think they finally won, sudden destruction. For the Lord himself will come. At an hour you think not, the Lord will come and he will battle the enemies of Israel. He will battle the enemies of his church. He will battle the enemies of the Messiah. And it's going to be a one-sided battle. You can read the rest of the chapter of Zechariah and you will find just how the enemies of the Messiah and the enemies of Israel, the enemies of Christ's church, are going to meet their end. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be dramatic. It's going to be bloody. It's going to be violent. And it's going to be swift. You see, God remembers his covenant. He will preserve his people, his followers, his faithful ones. We go back to Luke chapter 21. And let's listen a little further and see how it coincides with what Zechariah had written centuries before. Verse 21, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Those who are in the middle of the city must leave and those who are in the country must not enter the city. Because there are day, these are days of vengeance. Whose vengeance? God's. So that all things which are written will be fulfilled. That includes Zechariah 14. Woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations. You remember what Zechariah said? They'll fall by the sword. Many will be led captive. Folks, this looks beyond 70 A.D. When, in 72 when the Jews were expelled. Before the regathering that began in the 1800s to the land of Israel whose name had been changed to the land of the Philistines as an insult by the Romans. And as a way of saying to the Jews, you will never come back. But you see, there's someone else bigger in control. The Romans weren't sovereign. God is sovereign. He raises the nations and he brings them down. Rome has risen and Rome fell. But God's plan continues on. There is no plan B. God is not wringing his hands wondering what he's going to do. We're right on schedule. We see it happening around the world and before our very eyes. Our redemption really is drawing nigh. The nations rage. Kings take their stand against the Lord and against his Messiah. And God laughs and he scoffs. And he says, as for me, I've installed my king. It's King Jesus. We're right on time. We're not early and we're not late because God dictates the schedule. 
He goes on to say, Woe to those who are pregnant. There will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Zechariah describes this. Look at Israel. Look at the map today. Who surrounds Israel? And it's a simpler question to ask who is for Israel. It's a very short list. Shortly after World War II, there had been so many Jews that had died, that had been killed during the Holocaust. And not just in Germany, but in Russia. Even the U.S. was not so friendly. Britain wasn't either. But finally, the United Nations concluded that if we do not allot a place of land, a piece of land to this people group, they will cease to exist. And so in 1948, the foundations had been laid back in the 1800s. You can read the history. The foundation began to be laid back in the 1800s for a land to be set aside for the Jewish people. And finally, they camped upon what we know as the state of Israel today. This is God's doing. This is not man's doing. Man makes his plans, but it is God who directs the paths. And in 1948, Israel was recognized by the United Nations as a nation state. But the battle was not over. Much was to be done. And even today, Israel had been whittled down and whittled down less and less. In 1967, the Six-Day War, they increased their land mass. They went against the nations that were plotting against them, planning and struck with lightning speed and force and increased their landmass in six days. Golda Meir had it right. She told the nations that were supporting Israel or trying to get to support Israel during that time, she said, if you lose a war, you can go home. But if we lose the war, we have no home. He had it right. But you see, this is God's land. It is a, a people, Jew and Gentile folks, that God is in covenant with because we've been grafted in. Paul outlines that and tells us that God has grafted in the Gentiles, thereby both Jew and Gentile who believe in Christ are his covenant people. We are part of that. We're the wild olive tree, as Paul describes. But the worst, folks, is yet to come. It is coming. It is laid out before us. Jesus told his disciples, I have told you beforehand. Folks, we can watch it unfold before our very eyes. Look at Lebanon. Look at Syria. Look at Jordan. Look at Egypt. Where do they fit situationally and geographically? And where is Israel? They're surrounded. Other nations... During the time of the leadership of Menachem Begin in the 80s, there was found, and he made little news because there was another news event that eclipsed what they had found in Lebanon. But due to some really good intelligence, they had discovered a cache of weapons 
in around 1984, somewhere in that time, they had discovered a cache of weapons that was so large and the technology so sophisticated that the Lebanese could not use those weapons. They were stored. They had been slowly shipped in and were such a large cache of weapons that it went beyond what was necessary to conquer Israel. It was intended to be used at a later date by a force and by an army that understood the technology because they had made it. The Syrians couldn't use it because they didn't have the technology or the understanding. The Lebanese couldn't use it. The Jordanians couldn't use it. But it was enough weaponry with such sophistication that it would have been possible to capture most of the Middle East. And where did it originate from? Russia. Israel confiscated those weapons. But it made very little news because there were other news that was eclipsing all of this. There's always been plans. Long ago, this was put in place to accomplish what Christ and what Zechariah is describing. Folks, who knows what's available now? Because it's Russia's intention not to only capture Israel, but to take the Middle East. This is unfolding. This is working before our eyes and sometimes under our noses. Jesus goes on to say in verse 25, there will be signs in sun and moon and stars. You remember what Zechariah said? The luminaries would come dim. There will be on earth dismay among the nations and in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. In Hebrews chapter 12, you can read this. God says there's going to come a day when I'm going to shake all that is created. And the only thing that can't be shaken is what will remain. The only thing that can't be shaken is what's eternal. And God says I'm going to shake and I'm going to shake. I'm going to shake everything except that which cannot be shaken. Read it. Hebrews chapter 12. That's your assignment this week. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Why? Zechariah says that Israel has been taken. Jerusalem has been captured. The city plundered. Women ravished. Half of the city taken into captivity and expelled. He's coming on the day of vengeance to battle his enemies. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up. I hear my mother's voice in that. You better straighten up. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up. Lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Folks, look to the east. Keep your eyes on Israel. Keep your eyes on Jerusalem. Listen. Watch, but do not be dismayed.
for this is God's doing. Zechariah says, God says, I will bring the nations. And folks, what God is doing, no one is going to be able to stop it. Because this is the prelude. This is the precursor of the coming, the second coming, the victorious coming, the visible coming, the literal coming, the glorious coming of Messiah, our King. Then he told them a parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see it and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Folks, these are troublesome times in which we live in, but these are exciting times. Because the church has not seen what we see these days. Truly I say to you, this generation, which generation? This generation that sees all these things will not pass away until all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not, be, will not pass away. Jesus is saying this is impossible to stop. What has been declared, what has been predetermined, what God has purposed in his heart and his mind, his faithfulness will be accomplished. His covenants will be fulfilled and his Messiah will be established on the throne of David. God says in Psalm 2, as for me, I have installed my king. It's already done. It's already settled. No one is going to be able to stop it. It is done in the mind and in the heart of God. Recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass till all these things take place. Heaven and earth pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard. So that your hearts will not be weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life. And that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. But keep on the alert at all times. Praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Now during the, day, during the day he was teaching in the temple, but at evening he would go out and spend the night on the Mount of Olives. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come and see him in the temple and to listen. To him. Folks, Jesus did not mince words. These are hard sayings. The worst is yet to come, and it is going to get worse. Jesus says in Matthew 24, there is coming a time on earth such as has never been before or ever will be again. And if those days are not cut short, he says they're going to be so bad that if those days are not cut short, there will be no flesh that will survive. Read Revelation. Read the seals. Read the trumpets. And when you get down to the bowls, folks, everything that supports life is being quickly stripped away, destroyed. Fresh water, poisoned. The air depleted. The luminaries deficient. At a time you think not, the Son of Man will come. His feet will stand upon the Mount of Olives. And in the end, Jerusalem will win. Because their Messiah will Deliver them.
The saddest thing is, though, is to stand at the Wailing Wall and watch and listen and hear people pray that their Messiah would come. For the first time. And he's already come. Nearly 2,000 years. Folks, when he comes again, every nation is going to grieve. People are going to be perplexed. But you and I are a blessed people because we are informed. Jesus says, I have told you. He told his disciples, I have told you before it happens. We're to be ready. We're to stand steadfast. We're to be hopeful. To be joyful. And to know that our redemption is near. And the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these, these words. Thank you for preparing us. Thank you for guarding us and guiding us. Thank you for redeeming us and thank you for giving us this hope and this understanding that you are sovereign and in control. We are your people, the people of your pasture. And by your great grace, you have grafted us in and we are part of the covenant community. We are part of Israel, the wild olive tree and the natural olive tree. And we will serve you and we will serve with you when Messiah comes. Father, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But they only will know peace when they receive the Prince of Peace, Messiah. Father, we pray for salvation for men and women all around the world. That they will hear this message. That they will embrace Messiah. Trust Him as their Savior. Be redeemed and be restored. Father, we go forth with a message, a message of your great grace and the gospel of your kingdom and the account of your precious Son who died for us, paid our sin debt in full, who is seated at your right hand, with whom we're already seated, and is coming again. Father, I pray that we will be found faithful, steadfast, on the alert, and on guard. Heads bowed. I'm going to ask you now, do you know this Jesus? Have you trusted this Christ? Have you received him as Savior? Trust him now. Call out to him. Believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, his son, that he paid your sin debt in full and that he's seated at the right hand coming again as we've talked about here. May we be found righteous in your eyes having been declared righteous as a gift through faith in your son. We go forth now from this place as a testimony to your great grace with a word of hope on our lips and that centered on Christ your son it is in his name that we pray Amen